Today we are installing an EV charger. We're doing this outside and the, the charger that we're using is made by ELEC-Q. They do actually include some nice hardware. They included stainless steel screws, use a PH3, it's a larger size Phillips. We are using 3 quarter inch liquid tight conduit for our runs today. Now we only need three conductors because we have two hots and a ground. So I guess let's talk about wire sizing here for a minute. And it really comes down to how many amps you're gonna configure the charger to be operated with. This thing can work with all the way up to 50 amps of current, which is pretty impressive. However, I think in most cases, you're probably gonna to wanna to wire it for just 48 amps because there's only a difference of two amps and to get those last two amps actually causes a lot of inconvenience. Mainly because we're gonna to have to upsize our wire even further than this already stout wire and we're gonna to have to get a larger breaker. In addition to that, the conduit is becomes a little bit on the edge of being big enough. This is a three quarter inch opening like we talked about earlier and to push two six gauge wires and one 10 gauge wire, I just gave away the size, that is perfectly fine and really easy to do. If however, we wanted to push two four gauge wires and one eight gauge wire because the ground would actually have to be upsized as well, uh, then it's gonna be a lot more difficult. So in my opinion, it makes the most sense to go with six gauge. It's gonna give you the ability to run it at 48 amps, which is actually I think the maximum that my car can take anyway. And the only difference is that last two amps that this thing could theoretically handle. So that's what we're gonna do. Now one more really important thing to note is that with Romex, so if you had a cable assembly where it's all together and not separate strands, that's called a cable. Now those cable assemblies or Romex uh, are rated in the 60 degree column, not the 70 degree column. And that actually is really important as well because since we're gonna be using a 60 amp breaker to feed this, the wire has to be rated to handle that 60 amps. And if you use Romex in the 60 degree column, that's technically only able to handle 55 amps. So you really wanna be running conduit and pulling separate strands. This is THHN or THWN wire that will go inside of this conduit. And then we can safely have a 60 amp breaker feeding this with no issue whatsoever. Now you might be wondering, Ben, if, if you're putting a 60 amp breaker on it, why can't we still get the 50 amps through this thing? And the reason for that is that we are going to be abiding by the 80% rule, which is that we cannot exceed more than 80% of a circuit's rated capacity for a continuous load. And an EV charger is most certainly a continuous load. They can charge for a very long time depending on the size of the battery and the state of charge. So that's why if you take 60 times 0.8, it comes out to 48 amps. That's why these things run at 48 amps. So we're gonna go ahead and push these through here. We've got two hots and a ground. No neutral conductor is needed, so we only need three wires, which is kind of nice. Now we're gonna strip back our sheathing, approximately 16 millimeters. So like 5 eighths of an inch. Now it really shouldn't make much of a difference at all, but I've got my phasing marked on L2 as red, just so I can keep track of it all the way back to the panel. Since these are stranded conductors, it's good to kind of wiggle them back and forth as they seat. There we go. And you can see right back here, it tells us our terminal torque, 45.1 inch pounds. And we're only supposed to use copper conductors two to six gauge. Now, since my utility provider has off peak charging available, we are putting in a meter socket that's going to allow them to keep track of the energy usage separately. Specifically for me, it's gonna be 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour, as long as I charge during off peak hours, which is overnight, and then there's a window of time during the day as well. Uh, if I were to charge during on peak times, then it's gonna be 33 cents a kilowatt hour. For now though, let's go ahead and get our wires connected. Down here is the load side, 
and up here is the line side. So we'll connect our two hot wires to these two terminals here on the bottom, and then our ground wire is actually just gonna land right here, right back here in the middle. We're not gonna have any neutral coming through this box, which is actually important because if we did have a neutral or need a neutral, we would have had to have purchased a meter box that had a separate neutral and ground connection. This one does not have that because a lot of times your meter socket is gonna be your first uh, point of entry for your, your power coming to your property. So in that case, they would be in the same place, but this one's separate. So since it's just a ground wire going through, it's not gonna be a concern. No neutral needed here. Those first couple connections I stripped back using this Knipex cutter. This is not really the right tool for that. I actually went and got my larger gauge stripper. That is a much better experience. It almost seems like this episode is sponsored by Southwire. It most definitely is not, but I will link to these in the description. This Southwire screwdriver is actually pretty nice. It has the right sizes for most electrical connections that you need to make. It even has the right size to get a hold of these lugs here. Now I've seen it done both ways with the with the phasing marked red. I typically see it as red goes on the right hand side, um, but there's some conflicting information out there, so comment down below. 50 inch pounds is what we want to go to for torquing these down, and we can go all the way from 14 gauge up to 2 aught aluminum or copper. So 6 gauge is perfectly acceptable. Now I'm going to pop this knockout in the bottom and bring our line side wires into the box and then feed them into our main panel over here. You can always, always use a magnet to clean up the little bits of metal. Uh, obviously whenever you're working in the electric panel you've got to be super cautious and cognizant of where energy is flowing. So we're going to definitely be turning off our main right here. But just because we turned off the main doesn't mean that there's no power. There's still going to be power uh, coming up to the meter um, and then into our main breaker. So we have to just keep that all in mind. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be landing this on a 60 amp breaker. So we've got a Siemens double pole 240 volt breaker that we'll be landing these onto. I'm actually going to go ahead and land them onto the breaker before we snap the breaker into position makes it a little bit easier. Now I have disconnected power right here. However, we do still have live lugs over on that side and we're gonna treat everything as if it's live just to make sure that we are safe. Always treat it as if it's live and most likely you will stay alive. <clears throat> so there are terminations on our 60 amp breaker with our six gauge copper. We're gonna to wanna to torque those down to specification. In this case, it looks like we're gonna be torquing them to 45 inch pounds. And then back there we landed our EGC, Equipment Grounding Conductor. Not to be confused with the GEC, which is the Grounding Electrode Conductor. And there we have it. Our wiring is complete. Now in order to get this working temporarily, we're actually gonna bypass the meter for now. And this isn't breaking any rules, we're going to just be purchasing electricity at the standard rate instead of the discounted off-peak rate. So we're putting in these little tin-plated copper bypass bars. They're rated for up to 200 amps actually. But you would only ever use those in a temporary situation like what we're, like what we're doing right now. And then this plastic cover we got to make sure that we are safe. Um, and normally that would actually snap into where we just put those bars in, but I think if we turn it a little bit, it actually still can go in place. Well, I think it looks pretty clean so far. Uh, everything is wired all the way up to our box, so all we have left is to drop this in place, which is really easy. We do have a little clamp to go over the top of our wires. Right here you can see these are the metal tabs that actually slide down into those three connection points right there. Now we drop our cover over the top like that. And then finally there's one little lock screw that goes right down here at the bottom. This stuff technically needs to be secured within 12 inches of a termination. Oh yeah. And just like that, 
she's installed. Now when you install an EV charger, one of the main considerations is whether or not your existing electrical service can actually handle that load. An EV charger is no joke because it is a continuous large load. It's not even really intermittent because uh, you can be charging for several hours uh, in order to actually charge your EV fully. So we have to take into consideration how many amps you have available. So if you had a 100 amp service, it's very likely that you're gonna to need to consider what your total load is on your electrical system and make sure that you're not exceeding what it was designed to do. And a good way to do that is to install an electric monitor that actually can communicate with your charger. And that's exactly what ELEC-Q has done. So I'm gonna go ahead and install that here. Now this is where we need to install our CT clamps. This is the live conductors coming from the utility. So you have to be extremely cautious when we're working around this uh, at all times. Now we want, we want to look at the arrow on the side of these uh, clamps and it's going to tell us to put that in the direction of current flow. So we're going to go actually like this because the current is flowing up into the panel in this particular case. Now I'm just going to route these wires over so that we can connect them to our module. Now we're ready to plug this into our power monitor. Last step is just going to be connecting power. So there's our hot and then right back over here is our neutral. And that's it. Everything has been installed. So now we're going to do a little bit of cable management here and then we will begin adding the device to our account. Now you'll have to refer to the setup instructions for your specific needs. Uh, but basically I'm scanning this charger into my app, which I've already done. And now we need to pair it with our monitor. Now presumably these could be really far apart. We're setting this up uh, using uh, Wi-Fi. So normally these wouldn't be back to back necessarily. And that's why having this remote power monitor is so useful. You can configure it to limit the charge current depending on the loads that are happening at that moment in time. So we're gonna go ahead and add our power monitor and scan the NFC tag. There we go. It uses your phone to actually write the settings to the monitor. There we go, so now that everything's been configured, we can go ahead and transfer this, and we're gonna transfer it to my email address. Transfer successful. So now that I've transferred it to my personal app, you can see we do have our devices in there just fine with the monitor and the EV charger. So we are good to go. There's lots of settings to configure in here based on your needs. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and flip the switch. Ready? All right, it's on. Let's see if it lights up. Oh yeah, there's a light on it. <laughs> that must mean it's gonna work, right? Access is by verification right now, um, but we're gonna change that to auto start, but we can also use an RFID key card Oh, you can set up a phone key. That's kind of cool. When the phone is nearby, charging will automatically start upon plugging in. Okay, that's cool. Let's set it up. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but anytime I have the option to like adjust the brightness of a light, I turn it all the way up. Because why not? There is a schedule function to enable. So we might be doing that at some point once we get our meter in. There goes the neighbor. Pressing the button does not open the door. Start charging. And now the indicator is telling us, and then you can see back here on the car, it's blinking green. 48 of 48 amps. I'm super excited to have this EV charger installed. I think it's gonna be very convenient, especially as we get into the months where we need to do more grid charging. I do have some solar charging out over there that I try to use as much as possible, but a lot of the time there's not quite enough solar uh, to be able to keep us topped up, especially as we get towards winter. Uh, definitely December, January, we're gonna be using this a lot. So uh, definitely check it out if you're interested in an EV charger. It seems like it's a pretty good unit. I like some of the features with being able to use the RFID cards and your phone as a key so it's not just open to whoever drives by. All right, thanks so much for watching. 
We'll talk to you guys in the next one. See ya. Oh my goodness, you got all those on your own? These are wild black raspberries and they are so good. Oh, there's a spider in them. That's a cool spider.